Welcome to Green Building Matters, the original and most popular podcast focused on the green building movement. Your host is Charlie Cicchetti, one of the most credentialed experts in the green building industry and one of the few to be honored as a lead fellow. Each week, Charlie welcomes a green building professional from around the globe to share their war stories, career advice, and unique insight into how sustainability is shaping the built environment. So settle in, grab a fresh cup of coffee, and get ready to find out why green building matters. Hey everybody, welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Charlie Cicchetti, and I just love once a week I get to interview architects, engineers, contractors, but really green building professionals somewhere in the world. And today I've got Eric Robinson with us. He's with Rody Architects. He's a principal and co-founder there up in the Boston area. Hey Eric, how you doing today, man? Good morning, Charlie. Good to see you. Oh, man, I'm excited to learn more about you because you came highly recommended from our guests, which is saying something. So let's see what they knew about you that might be good for our audience and our other listeners. You know, Erica, I love to get that origin story first, though. So take us back. Where did you grow up and go to school? So how far back do you want to go, Charlie? Because I can start at the beginning of time. So, yeah, man. Um, <laughs> back, you know, because I want to know those influences. You know, some grew up near nature. Some traveled the world with their parents. I don't know. Just take us back. Yeah. Good. Okay. So probably, you know, the most I kind of relatable, I guess. is So I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area um, outside of, of Washington in, in Alexandria, Virginia, actually. Uh, okay. um, my uh, so I spent sort of my, I guess, formative years there from first grade through high school. Uh, we lived really uh, close to the Mount Vernon uh, estates, George Washington's house, um, you know, quite beautiful um, along the river. Um, but my father worked downtown in, in DC. He was a, a lobbyist uh, on Capitol Hill for um, uh, Detroit Diesel Allison, which is a subsidiary of General Motors and military division. And so we we were we had like a lot of cool things <laughs> growing up. We would go on uh, helicopters and PT boats and aircraft carriers because he was putting the engines in them. And so we had this kind of like very dynamic kind of uh, you know sort of youth, I guess, from uh, seeing some things that are was really cool. And so you know, spent a lot of time with him and, and sort of his ventures. But we 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 had a house and. You know, we did a lot of work on the house. He was one of these guys that uh, I am similar now, my adult life, where we worked on the house a lot. And, you know, I think uh, being an architect now, I, I reflect back on that a little bit. And, you know, I was very in tune to the place that I lived in, in terms of the structure and the, and the house. And, the, you know, we we put in skylights when I was like 12, you know, and I was up on the roof with him doing these things. And so learned a lot about things probably not consciously, subconsciously about space, light, kind of three-dimensional aspect of, of that um, just by doing it and kind of living it a little bit with him. And so, you know, that was sort of part of the kind of the, the, the upbringing. And I was always doing art classes and art things with different uh, programs and, and such, not so formal in a lot of ways, but informal. Um, and then in high school, took a couple technical like drawing classes, sort of like the basic architecture classes that everybody could take. That was, you know, interesting to me. It had sort of uh, two different teachers. The first one was um, uh, awesome, I'll say, and the second one, not so awesome. And, you know, we had a, a, a difference of opinion, I'll say, on the final class project in high school about <laughs> our um, our dream house, right? And he said we were designing our dream house. And my dream house was pretty pretty dynamic, right? And, and it had curves and all this crazy stuff. And he was like, he and I got in this huge fight about it. And I was like, well, it's my dream house. Like, what, right. what, what are you going to tell me? You know, and so and he, he, I remember he screamed one time, he said, he'll never be an architect. And, oh, and I, I didn't even know that was really what I was thinking. But, you know, and so I uh, kind of finished high school with no real plan, like I think a lot of people. And um, I went to just a four-year college to... Um, sort of find my, what, what I wanted to do a little bit. And uh, during that time, I took a class, um, an art class for one, with one of my professors. And he said, hey, have you ever thought about architecture? And I said, well, you know, it's probably in there somewhere. But, and he, he recommended that I um, transfer to NC State, actually, and um, went into the design program in NC State and or transferred in and, and started there. And 
kind of that was the sort of basis of mm. uh, sort of my uh, you know education in early. Oh yeah. man. Yeah, I love those influences and and what, how you describe the the house and the skylight and just you know that had influence on you. I don't know, uh, Goodwill Hunting reference. Uh, how do you like them apples? Hopefully, that high school teacher uh, you know knows where you're at so, now. You I, I've tried to look him up. I've tried to look him up. I won't use his name. I, I don't know if he's yeah. even still around yeah. or not. But I think you know. I think it's 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 one of these lessons that you you learn in life or you you reflect on in your life, where sure. you know you, you have these sort of influences. And they can be good and they can be bad, right? I mean, I think you sort of take those and, and uh, you know, it's not that he spurred me to do this, but I think that he he sort of, you know, it, that was always stuck in my mind of like, how do you kind of put that label on somebody or sort of talk about things in that way? And, and so, yeah, I think I think a lot about it and how that starts to influence all the things, you know, you do do after that in terms of. Yeah, thanks yep. for telling us that story. And uh, so now we know how you get into architecture. Um, now, what about green buildings and sustainability? When did that first come on the scene for you? So I think it, it started when I really probably went to NC State. So the, the NC State program is interesting and and honestly didn't really know too much about it. But it is a, a you know, I have an environmental design and architecture degree. So it's kind of a, you know, a sustainability. It was the basis of the design work that we did at NC State. So the program is based around, you know, thinking about sustainable principles from the beginning. And, you know, it's, and, and that was, you know, that was before LEED and before all the sort of um, programs that are in place, or at least familiar with me, where, you know, it was all about thinking about siting your buildings, you know, how they, so how they're placed on, you know, on the site sort of in their exposure to uh, sun and natural, you know, so it was really sort of the inherent kind of basis of design uh, principles of sustainability. And then, you know, that was kind of really the sort of eye opener to the basics of it in terms of my brain. Yeah. You know? Oh, man. Yeah. Mentors, you, you, you've alluded to some. Anyone else, maybe along the way, you looked up to, uh, maybe opened a door for you. Any other mentors? Yeah, I think there's one. My, I, I think my first real, I have a real job, but my first real job coming out. So I, I finished NC State, uh, and then I went and worked uh, for a couple of years in Richmond, Virginia, for two three years between graduate school and undergrad. And I just, you know, I, it was. You know, architecture program is fairly brutal <laughs> and grueling and I was tired and needed a little bit of a break to reset myself. And, um, so I worked for a couple of years and then I went to uh, university of Virginia for grad school. And when I was at the university of Virginia for grad school, one of the, my last year there visiting professors came to the school from Boston actually. And it was a husband and wife team, Marianne Thompson and Charles Rose who had a firm called Thompson and Rose. And I had no idea who they were or anything, to be honest, and signed up for their, their class and, you know, spent the semester with them. We did an amazing project, um, which was actually a real project in Wyoming for the office for um, at-risk kids from South Central LA who were being flown out to Wyoming to learn sort of different skill sets. And here we were in school, like working on the real project for the office and you know we flew out there and spent a couple of days in Wyoming and it, it was just unbelievable and uh you know when I kind of finished up that that class or that semester Charlie and Marianne said hey if you want to come to Boston you know we'd love to have you work at our firm and and you know I my wife's from North Carolina we were sort of southern based in some way and never thought that would happen but when you come to graduation and you need a job and hey. you might have you might want to have one I said, Let, well, let's go. And so we, we moved to Boston and I started working with Charlie and Marianne. And, you know, they were, I think they really took the sustainable principles and then layered on conceptual design work and forward thinking, you know, design as really the hallmark of their firm. And, and I learned a lot from them and how to kind of pull all that together. So, um, you know, I worked there for about eight years and, you know, learned a ton. I was doing work all over the country, uh, very sort of forward thinking design work. Um, and it was an awesome time, you know, to sort of learn yeah. 
uh, learn more about me as a designer and learn how to sort of produce, uh, you know, design excellence in the projects we were doing. So it was all kind of integrated into that aspect of sort of a career move. Mentorship and also them taking a leap of faith on you. It got you to Boston and been there since. So, uh, well, yep. and then tell us about what it took to, you know, start your own uh, firm here with your business partner. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned, I was working all over the country. I was working a lot. Architects tend to work a lot. You know, we, we feel uh, very passionate about our work um, and we tend to work too hard probably in some ways, but I had been there for a while. It was, it was good, good run. No, no question. Um, but my father actually passed away in that same kind of time. And, you know, I had a uh, young kid at the time. I was traveling a lot and didn't see a lot and then had another kid. And it just dawned on me that, you know, family matters. And not that I didn't know that, but I was away so much and traveling so much that I really needed a significant change in my life. And so I basically told Charlie, you know, I'm leaving and I'm going to start my, start my own firm. I just needed to have more control over my life. And that was really the seminal moment for me. Um, and then, you know, in that sort of same kind of time and, and cycle, Kevin Diebler, who's my business partner. So I'm the row of Rody. He's the D of Rody. We were undergraduate classmates at NC State. We were both in Boston. We were friends. Uh, we didn't work together, but we were connected. And he was kind of going through a similar thing, not necessarily personal sort of issues, but, you know, needed to move on from his sort of career uh, where he was. And honestly, we just said, hey, let's let's try to do this together. And, you know, that was about 17 years ago. So wow. the rest is history in some way. But, um, you know, we both needed a, a change. So timing's everything, I think, in a lot of ways. And Great. You know, we took the, that leap of faith together, and um, here we are. So, and, I, and I've looked at the team profile, the cool projects you're on, and, and we'll get to that next. Uh, one more look back. Uh, yep. Some of your proudest accomplishments. Wow. What's on the highlight reel? I mean, I, you know, listen, I mean, I, I'm reflecting back on, on, you know, starting this firm is really kind of the the thing that's amazing to me. And, you know, the, the fact that we sort of kind of just got together, uh, said, let's try this. You know, I think we had the right kind of sort of situation uh, to kind of foster this kind of relationship we had. We was built on a, a respect. Yeah. I mean, we were, you know, they say don't start a, a sort of a firm or, or a, you know, a company with a friend. But I think, you know, we've learned that you got to start it with the right friends, you know, um, and it has to be based on a level of trust and understanding. And it's not going to be easy. That's OK. And, I, you know, I look back and I think it's just transformed my my whole life in terms of what I would sort of, you know, never could have anticipated. We would be 30 people now um, wow. doing the projects we're doing, you know, talking to folks like yourself <laughs> and being recommended is even crazier in my, my, my brain. So it's just one of these moments that worked out for me. And I mean, we work hard, don't get me wrong, but you know, it's, it's luck and timing and, and some other things that kind of go into it. But um, that's really probably one of the sort of moments that I can reflect on. I mean, I think that, you know, and that, that course in, at UNC Greensboro when I was just sort of figuring it out where my professor said, hey, have you ever thought about architecture? Because I certainly wasn't thinking about architecture at that time. So, you know, I feel very lucky that um, things happened and, and sort of stars aligned in some way. And I, it's, it's all been fairly fortuitous in some way, but cool. you know, that's okay, right? <laughs> Love it, Eric. It. Yeah. I see the passion and you're really proud of your team. And this, you know, projects, it's, you can't pick a favorite kid, right? Or favorite pet. And I'm not asking for your favorite project, but are there one or two projects that stand out? Sometimes they're even the small ones, man, that was just a really fun project to work on. Are there, are there one or two you could give a, a glimpse into that? Sure. You work? I, we, you're right. We have many, many projects. I, I, I love them all. I mean, we, we have been really sort of, uh, you know, given a, a lot of, amazing opportunities. I think that um, what I feel like they all uh, encompass, I guess, or, or sort of are related 
is we have super clients actually. Um, and the clients appreciate us for who we are and what we do. We are not a cookie cutter uh, architecture firm. We're a firm that thinks about design as a, a sort of transformational tool. Um, we want to do work that is engaging and sort of thoughtful. And so, you know, our clients have really been able to understand what we do and respect us for that. So, you know, all types of projects we've done from the tiniest thing you could imagine to, you know, we're doing massive um, master planning projects with four buildings and a hotel and a residential building and, you know, affordable housing building. And so it's really hard, but I think they all embody a very similar sort of aspect of kind of thinking about the users that are there, the the places that we're designing. Um, we are very site specific. So we do a lot of work on making sure the work fits and, and sort of is knitted. It's a good sort of citizen in its context in terms of the, the community we're building in. And that's really where we hang our hats. And, you know, it's the change is hard for anybody. Boston is, is it, you know, we're in, we're sort of still in a massive boom that we've been in. And, you know, a lot of the projects we do are in the neighborhoods of Boston where they, you know, it's their established neighborhoods. The people have been there for a long time and change is sometimes tricky and, and misunderstood. And I think what we've come to the table with is to talk about how we're approaching the work and what the benefits of it are for the community. So that all said, <laughs> we have, you know, a couple of kind of highlights, I think, which are for the firm we are working on right now and it's under construction, the largest supportive housing project in the city of Boston for certain in in some ways it's it's kind of one of those career projects of an uh, inspiring uh, user group so supportive housing for those who don't know it's really for people that are formerly homeless um, mm -hmm. and they basically come off the streets and provide them with a space that's theirs it's you know akin to a little bit of a hotel room size but it has a kitchen full service so that is what we're doing 140 supportive housing units with 76 low and moderate income uh, units as well. So there's 202 units um, in this building with all the support uh, services for more for the supportive housing units for um, the, those residents. But the best part about it, I mean, in terms of obviously that is amazing and aspiring, especially the groups that we're working with, which is the Pine Street Inn, which is the city of Boston's largest sort of homeless uh, advocacy group and, and works to shelter these folks. And then, you know, but it's in a community, it's in a neighborhood, right? And it, so here's a project that could be seen with some negativity. And we've built or designed, we're building it now, it's under construction, a building that will fit into the community and be a good citizen neighbor with this population. And so that is one of those projects that you just kind of can't believe. And, you know, and it's, we're seeing this more that we're doing affordable housing projects, which are, and to go back to your podcast, you know, they are sustainably based though. So this is, will be a lead silver building, which nice. is awesome. And so, you know, that leads to other things. So right now we're also doing um, another project that's fully affordable in the city of Cambridge, um, which will be 140 low moderate income housing that will be passive house. So even, you know, amping it up a little bit more. And so we are learning, I'll say, how to adopt and adapt these sort of principles to larger buildings. We have done some smaller passive house projects. We actually have done the first certified passive house uh, residential project in the city of Boston. So that was another one of our projects it's called Brucewood. Okay. It's uh, three single family um, houses in a standard neighborhood. They're contemporary for certain, but you know, the passive house, they're uh, built and designed and completed now, but to, you know, passive house international standards. So it's, it's a high caliber project that we, we learned a lot about and our office embraced that. And I think, you know, it's amazing to not to see some of these sort of principles and sort of 
projects really come together and be the basis of these projects. And, and I think that that's something that we're, we're, we're super excited about. I mean, it's just, I want to, what a cool set of projects. I mean, it's in your community. It's got the sustainability aspect. I'm a big fan of Passive House. And it almost sounds like it's part of your, the ethos there, your company at, at Rody. So, uh, so yeah, current day, uh, what's a day like for Eric? And tell us a little more about your architecture firm and where yeah. you're trying to take it. Sure. Great. So, you know, <laughs> we, 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 so as I mentioned, we're 30 people. And, you know, a mix of architects, designers, we have interiors on staff, we have four interior designers on staff. And then we obviously have our operations folks that help us keep the lights on and the, the business going, which is crucial. But we, we are in an open studio environment. We're all sitting in the same space, no offices. We work in a uber collaborative environment. Uh, we are in each other's business. We are on top of each other. We talk about design. We talk about the projects. So really my role as I'm learning it as a principal and owner, it's interesting, right? We, we, we started this firm. We didn't know what we were doing as owners and principals. And we're learning it still, you know, 15, 17 years in, um, how to be firm owners. And, but we are designers at heart, both Kevin and I. We want to be in the weeds. We can't be always in the weeds because that's not what our role is. But we want to be part of the process because the studio is a very exciting environment. We build a ton of models, which people are blown away by, um, like physical models. Like a lot of people are 3D models. Yep. But we build models. I'm actually in the shop right now. And we, we test and explore and think about our design projects as a group. So, you know, that is my day. I mean, I spend a lot of time on the phone. <laughs> course with with clients but my energy comes from the studio and you know it's i want to be here i want everybody to want to be here that is sort of i think the basis as you said or the ethos of our of our firm is to have an environment where you're respected as an employee you're we, we don't we don't want you to work 80 hours a week we want you to come in give us your best for the time you're here and we will do it together and, you know, we want to be respectful of that. You know, you're, you're on your personal career path and you, you might be here for a year or you might be here for 10 years. And we want everybody to be here forever, but that's just not sure. how it works. So we really work hard on ensuring that our culture of our firm is really the foremost and the, the important piece. So, yeah. Sounds like an awesome place to work. And uh, I do want to compliment you on your project map on your website. I love the colors. You can see all the diverse projects and, and all around, you know, where you're at there. I guess one follow up there is you have chosen to have all these different disciplines, all kinds of different projects, different green building rating systems. Is it, do you have to continually, you know, make sure the team is trained up or, you know, when you're hiring someone, it's maybe they bring a new skill set you didn't have. So, you know, uh, I always hated in business as an entrepreneur or someone says, oh, focus, focus on one thing. And, you know, here it's, you know, pretty diverse and maybe that's your competitive advantage. So can you speak to that a little bit is how do you how do you stay up to date, make sure the team has these different diverse skill sets so you can do all these different projects? Well, <laughs> uh, we do do a lot of that. <laughs> um, we, we, we're very diverse. We think we can even be more diverse. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about bringing on graphic designers and some other, you know, people, maybe even some landscape designers. So, because when we envision projects and work on projects, we see, we look at it holistically. So we're not looking at a specific discipline or a different, we, we think about it, it's a design problem, right? So, um, or, or challenge. So that's important. The firm is made up of, you know, I'd say uh, we're a Heinz 57, right? Everybody has come from a different place to bring in their talents and their skill sets at Rody, We work extremely hard on finding the right people. So we uh, have a, I'll say a policy, but we're not really policy driven, but we, we have a policy that we don't hire for projects, we hire for the firm. So we want to find people that want to be here, can contribute to the environment we have here and be part of something special in our minds. So, you know, everybody brings their skill set. We talk a lot about people come in with ways they've done it at their firm or previous employer or whatever it is. 
we talk a lot about that's cool. How do we do it the roadie way? What's the best way for roadie to do it? Because we're different and we think differently. And so those um, pieces are kind of really come together in a, in a, in a way that we don't always understand, to be honest. <laughs> and, you know, I think the, um, in terms of the, the sustainability aspect of the firm, one of the things that we have really, I guess, made a conscious effort is to push that a little bit more forward in the sort of premise of who Rody is. And we've always been a sustainable firm from a sort of core principle aspect of it, but it hasn't really been pushed to the forefront of who the firm is. In terms of if someone looked up sustainability there, we're probably not coming up on the first page of the Google list, right? That's just not who we are. But we are that in the core. So, you know, for example, we've hired a woman um, who came from a, another firm and, and she sustainability is really in her DNA. And, you know, she has been here about a year now and just crushing us and pushing us forward and making sure we're doing the right things and getting, you know, getting it a little more organized, I'll say, and getting a little bit more kind of on top of it. You know, she's gotten us signed up on the AIA 2030 commitment. So we are, we are into that. And, you know, she's also starting to kind of like fine tune the sort of the way that we talk about sustainability in terms of some pillars and trying to make it make you know, a little bit more sense and, and, and sort of approachable that it's not esoteric, right? We want people to think like this and, and, and design like this and build like this. So she's really, really helped us to kind of hone our skills and our met. So, you know, she's going to help us make sure we have those things. And, and, you know, to date, a lot of that stuff has been outsourced, to be honest. So we'll, you know, bring in consultants, we'll bring in people that will help us along while we're understanding and learning, of course. But, um, no you problem know, uh, for yeah. that challenge, you know, it's a bold move to say, Hey, let's welcome that in. Let's, let's change things. Uh, as yep. they said, what got us here won't get us there. I, I hear you saying there's more you could even do, even though you're doing a lot of great green building projects, there's more you could do. Sounds like with the firm. So, and that's a good segue to my next question. One of my favorites, what's next in this green building movement? What, what are you excited about? What are you reading up on? What, what do you think's coming at us in this green building movement? So, I, I, you know, you, you probably know more than I do, but you know, I, I think what we're seeing maybe, I mean, we're, we're obviously seeing things like passive house. I think the, um, you know, the general, um, I'll say jurisdictional codes for lack of a better term, right? So the building codes we have to adhere to, they are definitely picking up, right? And, and creating more stringent in terms of a baseline. Um, I think that's good. Um, you know, that is the sort of, I feel like, you know, government needs to help lead us on this a little bit, right? It, and because it does come uh, down to dollars, obviously. And I think that, so I think those pieces are great. And I, you know, support that. Um, the city of Boston is looking to try to be very kind of progressive on this. The new mayor is pushing us hard on, obviously we have resili resiliency issues here in Boston with the, the on the water and, and flooding. And, um, you know, so we're seeing these things needing to be addressed. And that's, to me, that's powerful and that's good. Um, and I think that, you know, the sort of some of the other nuances that I see, I, I think we probably will, um, and we're seeing it, but I think we'll see more and more uh, modular sort of type construction and maybe not modular in the way some people think about it in terms of like the box and the whole sort of space that's built, but compo components being more modular. You know, we're seeing bathroom pods, kitchen pods, sort of smaller components that can be factory assembled. So you have, you know, you can track waste better. You can sort of be more efficient. It's built in an environment that is more controlled, obviously, and, and, and then brought to the site, you know, put in, hooked up, move on, right? So I do think we're going to see more and more of that. We're seeing quite a bit of that already. So I think that, that will be something that will carry us for a while. I mean, we're seeing much more panelized construction Similar thing on exterior walls. We are starting to do and look at more and more CLT buildings, cross laminated timber buildings. Uh, we're working on a, a, a very cool hotel downtown Boston 
that will be 12 stories. And um, we are with a sort of really incredible kind of historical three-story building base that we're going to kind of like carve out and then create a, a tower up above um, for a hotel, which we're looking at cross laminate timber CLT for that building, which will be so cool. And, you know, so we're doing a lot of research on it and understanding it and learning about how it goes together. And, you know, that's, I think that's another sort of future. We'll see the building codes are starting to catch up on it a little bit. So I think those are some of the trends, I guess, for lack of a better term, that we, we will be going down. Yeah. So amazing trends. You do have a really good feel for it. And I, I love the timber, the embodied carbon side of things, not just mm-hmm. efficiency. And and then one I'm really impressed is the modular construction, but in the in the pods, that's something we're going to start talking a lot more of here uh, on our podcast from time to time because that's a place I'm spending a lot of my time. And and so you've got a good feel for it, man. Those I second all those trends. Nice. So <laughs> let's uh, let's get to know you more. Uh, some rapid fire questions. What would you say is your specialty or gift, Eric? <laughs> oh man uh, <laughs> uh you know i think i have a, a a a knack of strategic i guess thinking in some ways you know thinking about things in, in a transformational moment you know and i don't have all the answers i don't know all the the sort of pieces sure. but i can i feel very you know lucky to be able to think strategically about things and, you know, visualize things and, you know, talk about things. I guess we'll, we'll find out how the, how my rating on this podcast is, but, you know, in a way that I think is, is, no, oh, it's, it, you know, it's human. I'm not a, I'm not a high, high, high sort of intellect, to be honest. I'm a, I'm a guy, right. And, and we're, we're trying to do um, some special stuff. But I think at the end of the day, I'm just, you know, I'm just a guy who's trying to sort of make a living and, mm-hmm. and you know, and, and sort of take advantage of the skills I have. And I think a lot of it is uh, getting the right people around you. And, yeah. you know, I think um, that is, to me, probably one of the biggest kind of uh, lessons of this is like hire the right people, the people, hire people that are better than you, smarter than you, and give them the ability to pull me along and they do. So, good. Yeah. Oh man. Thanks for sharing. Uh, how about good habits or routines or rituals? Do you have any good habits or routines you could share? I drink a lot of coffee. That's definitely a, 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 my ritual. <laughs> a lot of coffee, way too much. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if I do or not. Um, it's a good question. I try probably have thought about that a little bit more, but you know, no, I, I mean, I just, I go about my day. <laughs> I do, you know, I, I'm, I'm approachable. I'm sort of want to be, uh, you know, accessible. I want to be there for my staff. And so, you know, I sit in, in with, with everybody and, you know, it's not, you know, anything. I, you know, I don't run a hundred miles a, a day every morning. I don't like, <laughs> You know, I play squash every once in a while and I'll run, I'll run into the office every once in a while. So, you know, it's, but I, I don't really have a ton of routines and rituals, to be honest. I, I'm kind of like I'm one you're, of those guys. Yeah, <laughs> You're a creative, yeah, you know, for some, it's even planning ahead. Like I like to visualize my next day or just, you know, sometimes it's the planning, maybe it's the pen and paper to do list or not to do list. But I think uh, just the approachability here for your growing team is that's important, man. Yeah. So how about, um, you know, bucket list as we get to know each other more, I'm a fan of the bucket list. Um, what are one or two things maybe on your bucket list? I don't know, maybe adventure, maybe some travel, maybe you want to write a book. What, what's on the bucket list? Oh boy. Uh, I've never been to Scandinavia. That'd be cool. I, yeah. I think there's sort of like some beautiful architecture and, you know, sustainable aspects. So that'd be cool. That'd be a good trip. I'm, I'm an avid sailor. I've been sailing my whole life. I sail now a lot. It's my, um, it's my therapy. I like to say, (laughs) you know, I get out on the water. So I'd love to sail to the Caribbean or something and take some time and, and be out on the water. I mean, there's, it's a special time for me to be out there and think about things, you know, you get away from, the, the craziness of, of, of this and, and the city and things like that. So, you know, finding those, uh, some time 
for yourself is, is something I think is important. And uh, I do it on the boat and I do it when I'm working on my house. I'm very handy. I like to do things. So I find time to like, you know, kind of do stuff with my hands and, 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 and build and construct and do stuff. So, you know, those are, those are sort of some things. I mean, I think like, honestly, I mean, I guess I've achieved the, the, the firm is, is a bucket list item. I'm in it. I don't know if the buckets, if it's checked off or not yet. Cause I feel like the reality of it is I want it to be a legacy firm when I'm gone. And that's, that's a, that's something that I am setting this up with Kevin. We're both you know, lockstep in on that, that we want this firm to be a place for people to, to, to be part of once we're, you know, gone, whatever that means. So, you know, I'm working on it. I, um, I just got a Tesla last fall. Like that is, it's awesome. Like, you know, and, and I think that, you know, living, I've always been interested. I had a plug-in hybrid uh, Prius for a long time. And I, I, I love technology helping us move these things forward. The, it's, it's just great for me. I mean, I, you know, I haven't been to a gas station in 11 months. I think it's awesome, you know, <laughs> and I, and, and, you know, and it, it's, it makes me really think about like what we do because a lot of our projects, you know, require charging and, and sort of we have to have them EV ready or, or EV equipped. And I think thinking about that sort of whole sea change of how we think about fossil fuels and sustainability, I probably think a lot about it more than I probably think I do in some ways. And I think, you know, all of our buildings now are going all electric, you know, we're we're, you know, it's not, it's no longer or not as much, you know, I need gas cooking, no nope, induction works, you know, all these. So we're seeing this stuff happening right now in front of our face. And I think it's something that we as people uh, should embrace and should think about and, and really sort of envision it. And, you know, like, you know, up here in Boston, we, it's windy. <laughs> Right. And we have, you know, there's a ton of wind farms planned out in the ocean and sort of these up. And, you know, I just think it's like so, you know, inspiring to sort of think about how we're trying to kind of really do this. And, you know, I wish we could happen faster. I think maybe not everybody, but I think I wish it would. But I think it's we're starting to see it take hold in a way. And I think as designers and architects, we all know buildings are a massive energy hogs, you know, and so. I think we have to do everything we can um, as leaders to try to, you know, think differently about the way we're building buildings and architectures. Well, I'm a fan of electric vehicles. I've been driving electric cars for about 10 years and, and I just, it's so cool there with the, the Tesla and, and how that's impacted you to think even more about what's happening, you know, in society and, and our buildings. Uh, how about books? Uh, is there a book you'd recommend to our listeners? Could be anything. It doesn't have to be about buildings. Uh, yeah, uh, I am in a book club, but it's it's. I'm not that avid of a member. I, I'm. In, I think they're about to kick me out. I I, I kind of <laughs> actually asked them if they can rename it. You know, book book and social club. But um, right. uh, <laughs> I, you know what? I, what I do listen to um, uh, TED Radio Hour quite okay. a bit actually. Um, and I actually don't even go into the TED talk. <laughs> I'm a TED radio guy where I like to listen because there's shorter stories and sort of different aspects of it. So I do listen to that fairly regularly. Um, you know, and there's some amazing uh, sort of ones out there, obviously. And, you know, I think there's there's one that is, it's called The Power of Spaces that, I don't know when it came out, but, you know, they, they interviewed a, a couple different people um, one of them is uh, Michael Murphy, who is the founder of Mass Design Group, which is in a phenomenal design organization that actually was featured on 60 Minutes, I think, in the beginning of the year or earlier in the year. And, you know, really doing some unbelievable work. But then it was also kind of uh, kind of tagged or, or one of the other stories was uh, David Byrne from Talking Heads <laughs> was talking about um, the power of the spaces from the standpoint of him as a performer and talking about how the different venues he performs in uh, is super important to his show and influential in his show. And I just kind of was just like blown away by that. Like that's, that's a, so, you know, I think, I think the Ted talk or the Ted radio hours are like phenomenal little sort of snippets into things. And it gives you a, a nice overview. And then, you know, if you want to pursue it and take a look at the talk, but that's kind of, that's probably where I sort of spend a little time. Yeah. You know what? You've inspired me. I've, I've asked that question about books 
or 250 interviews, Eric, and I'm going to change it to book, documentary, podcast, or TED Talk. I'm going to yeah. start changing it up because I'm glad you went there and, and that will put a link for our listeners in the podcast show notes so they can check out that TED yeah. Radio. Last two questions. Uh, one, career advice. Is there anything you wish you'd known earlier in your career? Oh, man. Uh, you know, I, honestly, early in the career, I'm lucky. Early in my career, someone did sort of told me about this sort of notion of hiring people that are smarter than you. <laughs> I mean, I think that was really, and, you know, and they all, you know, so I think that's kind of like stuck with me. I mean, I think like, there's that. I think the the one thing that, uh, or a couple other things I think I can think of, you know, I could talk forever, but, you know, I think that as a firm owner and a business owner and then an architect trying to like understand my role, I think that for us, um, my connection to our client um, and the relationships I build with my clients is ultimately critical. And you know, I, and that that kind of comes in a whole bunch of different what forms or whatever you know you want to say. I think that you know the building industry in general, I'll say, is is tough, right? It's tough to build stuff. We the process is somewhat kind of I don't say upside down, but it's, we've been doing it for a lot of years, but it's complicated. Um, and so, you know, we draw something, we hand it off, somebody else is interpreting what we draw, and then all of a sudden we build it, right? And so it's not always perfect and it's not a linear process. So I think those relationships are key when issues come up. So we're, we're not perfect and we make mistakes and things are, are so, and, I, and I'm a super strong believer in saying, yep, we made that mistake, own it, We'll fix it. We'll take care of whatever we need to take care of and we'll build out from that. And I think so, you know, maybe nobody told me this, but these are things that I think we've learned over the years that you really do need to manage the relationships because that's what gets us here. And at least that's what I believe. And I think so that's ultimate. And then I think the last piece, I guess, would be to really invest in your people and your company. And I think that we want to be on the cutting edge of whatever we are doing. So if it's technology investment, if it's time investment, whatever it might be, it can be different things for different people in different situations. But I always feel like we need to keep reinvesting and reinvesting in what we're doing to keep us moving forward. So, yeah, I don't know. Great nuggets there, man. Thank you. I think people are going to start lining up to come work with you. And hey, that's a good thing. Yeah. We could use some people. So uh, right. we're hiring. <laughs> There's, yeah. All right, last question. Let's say yep. someone is listening to this podcast, man. They're getting inspired by your story. We've talked about a lot of things, cool projects, green buildings, company, what's next. And let's say they're just now jumping in either to architecture or maybe green buildings. Any words of encouragement for them? Wow. Hopefully the last hour or 45 minutes has been that. But I think, you know, I think try to continue to learn as much as you can. We're, you know, we, we are continually pushing people to be uncomfortable. Um, we believe when you're uncomfortable, you're learning. And I think, you know, this, this sort of green industry or even just business owner or whatever it is, it's all about sort of learning what you need to do. And, you know, I think be true to who you are and don't be, you know, afraid to ask questions and raise your hand and do all the obvious things that I think people lose sight of. But I think, you know, it's all there. It's just like, it's, you know, it comes out of us. And, and I think that being true to that, I, I think is really sort of my only words of wisdom. because <laughs> I believe in it. And, you know, I, again, we're, we're we, we talk about a, our firm is just a bunch of regular people trying to do great work. And, you know, that's, that's who we are. And I think it doesn't have to be, I don't think it has to be more than that, to be honest. <laughs> um, you know, you know, and it just has to be true. And, and I think, I think people really appreciate just being honest and sincere about what you're trying to achieve and, and be true to what you believe as a vision. And um, uh, I guess 
the rest yeah. hopefully will take care of itself. Well, man, you got me fired up. That's some good encouragement. One of my favorite business authors is Patrick Lincioni, and he says you need to hire people that are humble, hungry, and smart. Sounds like you got a whole bunch of that going on, humble, hungry, and smart. So, uh, Eric, man, thanks for spending time with us. To all of our listeners, check out Rody Architects. Connect with Eric on LinkedIn. And, uh, man, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Charlie. It was awesome. Really appreciate it. I just want to say thank you to our loyal listeners. We actually are celebrating over one year here on the Green Building Matters podcast. Me and the entire team were stoked and just so glad you continue to listen every Wednesday morning to a new interview with a green building professional here in this industry or just some pro tips that we want to make sure that you are getting straight from us, straight to you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues. And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.